over the last years, a number of Psych 131 graduates have gone on to Teach for America. Uh, it's a pretty awesome experience, and uh, check it out. So uh, welcome to Psych 131. We're going to spend a minute and actually read the syllabus. So take a minute and do that, and we'll talk about it. If you're just coming in, grab one from up front. some seats over on this side down here. So as you're going through this, I'll say a few things. If you're interested in the brain, if you're interested in culture and sociology, if you're interested in what this life trajectory we all go through is about, if, as of course many of you are interested in kids and adolescents and then on to adulthood, struggle with depression, anxiety, autism, ADHD, etc., you're going to find this course really fascinating. It's cool material. But this is a hard course. We'll grade fairly leniently, but you're going to have to work on essay exam questions. You're going to write in here whether you like it or not. And there'll probably be a written assignment in sections. The graduate level textbook for the course is a graduate level textbook. It's really hard. The readings outside of the textbook are very dense articles in the field, some very short, but you can spend an hour on a three-page article, some longer overviews. Lectures, I hope, will be reasonably clear. The exam material will be based a lot on the lectures and the notes, the slides, but also on these difficult readings. You've got to come to sections because they're required, and they'll be like a seminar added onto the lectures. It's not just review. It's not just what are the questions on the lecture material. And this is, of course, in delayed gratification. We're not going to start off talking about autism or learning disabilities. We're going to start off almost the whole time before the first midterm talking about conceptual issues, talking about development, talking about genes, talking about environments, talking about transactional models. Some of you are going to be saying, I thought I was going to actually learn something about child clinical psychology. I'd like to work with autistic kids. I do already. I really want to get a sense of prevention. Why are we doing this? Spinach may be good for you, but sort of boring material. If you stay with it, I won't guarantee it, but I will predict that by the time we come to talking about dimensions or disorders, all of this conceptual material will come alive and you'll have a better understanding of it. So you're going to have to stick with it. So let's introduce the GSIs in the back of the room. Raise your hand. Is Sheikh Ahmad, one of the GSIs, a first year student in our clinical program. Right here is Megan Knorr. Megan, stand up. First year student in the clinical science program in psychology. And Davin Duval. Davin is a first year student in the school psychology program in the School of Ed. Each of them will be leading three discussion sections each week. Don't, don't, don't. You didn't come yesterday. Don't come today. They start next week. And then there'll be attendance taken, and you, you'll be, there'll be sections every week, except possibly the weeks of the midterms. We'll have to figure that out. The stuff for the course is on B space. I think B courses has started, but that's too advanced for me. We'll do that next term. So this is good old B space. The syllabus is there. The lecture notes will be there a week ahead of time, and your GSIs will post up for sections there. This is a course that will be challenging, but I think rewarding. Okay, so there's a lot of people in here, and in fact, we're full. In fact, last time I checked, which I think was yesterday morning, the waiting list was 85 people. So what does that mean? It means that psych seniors and psych juniors will get priority. It means also that some of you may kind of actually be in the course, but you can't fit in a section. Because the sections, if you can't fit in one of the 25 slots in a given section, then you're shut out of getting enrolled for the lecture as well. Zoe Zhu, uh, one of our great undergraduate advisors from Student Services Office, will be here Monday, take a minute or two at the beginning of class to walk you through. If you really want to get in, you're on the waiting list, what are your odds going to be? If you're a major, the odds are much better. And we will start next week in sections. If the only thing keeping you from getting in is that you're in, you're a senior major, but you're shut out of one of the section times, we should be able to work out a way of getting people in some of the less impacted sections from the more impacted ones. So the course is an exercise in patience and delayed gratification. Getting in this course, for some of you, will be an exercise in holding on. There are going to be some drops. I don't know that everybody in the waiting list will get in, but in the past, persistence has paid off. So let's see. Anything else on that slide? I don't think so. So in a second, we're going to actually do a lecture today because we don't have enough time for all the material we want to do in this course. But before we do that, questions anybody has other than can I get in this course? Questions about organization, anything? Yes, please. Will there be RPP? No. This course does not have RPP. I know it's a disappointment. We'll, there'll be some counseling sessions outside to help deal with that, some massage therapy for those who are interested. So there will also be, and there's a little note on this on the syllabus, if you're in DSP, we will need a letter from the DSP office advising us of accommodations. And unless you have that letter, we, we can't do it. It's federal statute at this point. Other questions? Yes. So I believe that through this little microphone, from what I signed up for a couple of weeks ago, all the lectures will be podcast. 
Now the problem with my saying that is, when I said yes, podcast, no to webcast, because it costs the department $2,000, and then you can watch from TV in your apartment, and then you won't come to lecture, so we're not going to webcast, we're going to podcast. But when I signed up for it, it froze me out of getting signed up for it. Welcome to Berkeley. And so then they said, oh, we really want you to do it, and we think it'll work. So let me know at the end of the week or next week. If it's not on podcast, I'll have to go in and talk to them and sign a form or, or something like that. But yes, the intention is, with this microphone on Berkeley iTunes, these lectures should be ready pretty quick after each one's done. It has worked that way in the past. Other questions? I can't see you. One at a time. It's hard to pick. GSIs, anything? Anything? Make anything? All right, so let's, uh, let's go for it. Why would you study development in psychopathology? Well, psychopathology is a fancy Greek term for mental illness. We'll talk very soon about what mental illness is or is not. But one of the reasons for studying it is how are you find mental illness? There's a lot of it. There's a lot of it going around. So back over 10 years ago, over in England, the United Kingdom decided to do a national campaign to eradicate the stigma of mental illness. And what was the title of their five-year campaign? Every family in the land. Because the epidemiologists in the United Kingdom are similar to the epidemiologists in the United States and all over the world, showing that some families are more loaded than others. Genes matter. Environments matter. But it's hard to find a family that hasn't dealt with intellectual disability, schizophrenia, depression, bipolar disorder, ADHD, all the things we'll talk about in this course. So the numbers are actually fairly shocking. All these things are arrayed on a continuum from severe to mild. But even at the severe end, one out of every 16 people in the United States has a mental disorder so severe that they've considered or attempted suicide, have lost work, or become addicted to pretty serious substances. 6%. Another 20% in their lifetimes will have a form of mental illness severe enough to have ruined a lot of life chances and caused untold suffering. And then if you go to the mild end of the continuum, everybody's got kind of a fear of phobia, everybody's a little anxious, the prevalence rates climb to a third, 40%, or half of the population. So one of the things we'll talk about is where do you draw the line? Because if everything's on a spectrum, everybody's got a little bit of a certain disorder. But even if you're really stringent and go to the severe end, the prevalence is alarmingly high. So back almost 20 years ago, the World Health Organization decided to get in the business of studying mental illness, not just physical disease. And they, through health economists that they hired, derived these fancy formulas for either a physical or a mental illness. How impairing is this illness? And if you're into this topic, the little acronym is called a DALY, a D-A-L-Y, a Disability Adjusted Life Year. Only an economist could appreciate that, right? So how many years have you been alive? What's your projected lifespan? Does the disability-related illness uh, have effect on your income, your ability to have children, have a family? And so it's this formula that quantifies what the burden is of having HIV or having cancer or having schizophrenia. And when that study was first published in 1995, it's updated every few years now, of the 10 most impactful diseases on Earth, five of them were mental illnesses. Depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, eating disorders, OCD. And depending on the statistics over the years, major depression is now, for women, maybe number one or two, and men number two or three, the most impairing illness on Earth because of the high risk for suicide, because of the years it takes out of your productivity, because of the ruined relationships. So when the World Health Organization started quantifying it, people in serious governmental positions started to take notice. This isn't just soft. This isn't just, oh, you're not doing that well. Well, I've had a tough day too. This is serious impact on people's lives around the world. If you talk, if you take Psych 130, or if you talk about so-called adult mental illnesses, most of them have started well before you're an adult, whether in full form or in partial form. Similarly, what we used to call child disorders, autistic disorder or autism, ADHD, learning disabilities, learning disorders, don't go away when you hit 13 or 21 or 25. Maybe there's resilience. Maybe people overcome a lot of the impact. But mental illnesses of adulthood don't start in adulthood. They usually start well before. And mental illnesses of childhood tend to persist a long time. So you've got to have a lifespan perspective. That's why it's developmental psychopathology. So every single lecture, every single reading, even though it may not be front and center, it may be implicit rather than explicit, there'll be questions like, well, how do you know that this is really abnormal? Maybe it's just part of the human condition. What is normal? What is abnormal? What does it mean to be human and have emotions and have behaviors? How do we know that when they're disordered or not? This is, of course, a lot on development. We're just beginning to learn about how the brain develops. Incredible facts we'll talk about in a few weeks when we start to talk about neurons and brain development uh, will become very clear. And the facts will become clear, but how these things happen, how we're all born with 200 billion neurons and over the next couple of years form hundreds of trillions of synapses, and how this produces emotion and behavior and functioning is the big mystery. The Obama administration, as you know, is putting a lot of money not only into preschool education, but into the actual study of brain connectivity. Not just how the individual neurons grow, but how the brain connects. And it's, it would break every supercomputer in the world. It makes weather forecasting that look like child's play. So this is a huge computational and theoretical and empirical quagmire right now. Brain the brain's the most complicated organ in existence. How does it develop? How does it create healthy and, and unhealthy behavior? So these are the things we're going to be talking about in this course. Again, it's, I think, important as you're struggling with reading or thinking, well, how does this pertain to autism? Keep these big picture questions in mind. So it's developmental psychopathology. We'll talk a lot about kids and teens, childhood and adolescence. And it's interesting to note that through human history, childhood and adolescence haven't been given. Obviously, kids start little and get bigger. But you go back to medieval portraits from the great artists. And how did kids look in those pictures? They were little miniature adults. It's almost as though the artists were viewing childhood as just, well, you're kind of born fully formed, but you're just kind of tiny, and you get bigger. There weren't really stages or developmental phases. This is fairly recent in our thinking that childhood may be a stage of life, adolescence may be a stage of life, that is even qualitatively different from adult, adulthood. How have we dealt with kids throughout history, human history? Well, we've dealt with the kids who have survived birth and childhood, which is a minority of kids. Until the last century, the majority of kids in the world didn't make it till age two. The vast majority. Childbirth is difficult. Unsanitary conditions make it difficult. One perspective on human evolution is there's a trade-off. There's a trade-off between how big a baby's head has to be to contain a skull, to contain a brain with all those neurons, and how wide the mother's pelvis is. I mean, we're within about a millimeter or two, because humans have to learn a lot. And there's not a big space, literal space, for them to come out of the womb into the world. And then the diseases of infancy. I mean, when did vaccination start? Not that long ago. When was penicillin invented? When was it used? In the 40s. Throughout human history, most kids have not survived. And those who have, 
In some ways, have been treated like miniature adults. It's a labor supply. In agrarian society, since 10,000 BC, when agriculture became part of the human condition, kids are labor sources. When did child labor laws get enforced in the United States and in England? Not until the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. So kids have been subjected to harsh, brutal conditions, which is in some ways the human condition. Kids have been sold into slavery in many societies. Planned marriage is still the norm in many cultures around the world. Not much freedom choice, not much romantic love. The first known in the Western world actual treatise that children, childhood, were a separate thing was William Fair's English book, The Bulk of Children, and that kind of Middle English uh, pronunciation and spelling in 1545, well into the Renaissance. So we're talking about kind of recent history here. I sort of talked about some of the middle part of the slide at the beginning. In American history in the colonies, I went to college back east in Massachusetts and learned as a freshman in a, a sort of psychology course, uh, and I was interested in kids, about the stubborn child laws. They're still in the books. They haven't been revoked in Massachusetts. If you're a stubborn child in Massachusetts, the penalty is death. If you don't obey your parents and the court educates that you are sufficiently stubborn, you can be killed. I mean, this is, what, the colonies, the United States, the post-Renaissance? When did we actually come up with, as a field of mental health, the concept of child maltreatment or child abuse? 1962. This is really recent. This is 52 years ago. So the study of children is the study of economic legal disenfranchisement. The fact that kids would survive is nearly a miracle, and the fact that there might be separate developmental needs is really recent. So let's kind of shift into the last century or so. Child psychology got its start a couple of decades after the field of psychology got its start. The American psychologist G. Stanley Hall at Harvard in 1904, exactly 100 years ago, 110 years ago, said what? You know, there's this phase of life where you get physically mature, but you don't yet have full societal uh, rights. Let's call that adolescence. Now, many cultures have recognized that kids get physically mature, and maybe sometime before they're adults, but this was the first time anybody had academically written about it. So it's not just childhood, there's adolescence. And what happened about 11 years ago in a big journal that the American Psychological Association publishes? A couple of psychologists said, well, you know, are you an adult? Are you an adult when you're 18 or 21? Hard to get economic independence. The brain doesn't fully mature, especially if you're a guy, until you're mid to late 20s. There's a whole phase of life called emerging adulthood, the period between 18 and maybe 27 or 28. So the more we go, we're breaking life down into more and more discrete segments. But child psychology, adolescent psychology are pretty recent. That's the main point. If you look at the funding for basic research, if you look at the development of treatments, child psychology, child psychiatry are often way behind adults. Kids, they're just kids. Let's wait till they're adults. It's not that important. Kids get over these things. Now, developmental psychopathology, child and adolescent psychiatry and psychology, they don't get the funding that adult psychiatry and psychology do, but the advances, because of the rapid change in childhood and adolescence, the advances in these fields are now actually outstripping the advances in the adult versions of these fields. So we're in a time of big change. And I mentioned before about this very recent discovery, of course we knew it all the time, but it was under wraps, that kids might actually get maltreated. Kids weren't just chattel or property. 1962 is the year of publication in Colorado of this first book called The Battered Child Syndrome. And who were the doctors who broke the news to the field? Child psychiatrists, pediatricians? No, radiologists, x-ray doctors. Why did they break the news on child maltreatment? Because a few x-ray doctors back in Colorado noticed too many x-rays of kids' radial fractures of the forearm that couldn't have been caused by a fall. It could have only been caused by a parent ripping the kid's arm or throwing him down the stairs. So it took radiologic evidence to convince the medical field that there are patterns of intentional maltreatment of kids that lead to horrific injuries. And within 10 years, every state passed a law mandating reporting of child abuse. If you're a teacher, if you're a psychologist, if you're a doctor, even if you're a film developer, there's not many film developers in the digital age where you might see in your developing film child pornography. So the field goes through wild swings. We deny for millennia that there's really anything called child abuse. And then within 10 years, the big question is, are we over-reporting this? Are innocent families getting portrayed or educated for abuse when it was only part of a cultural pattern of punishment? So we'll be talking as the course goes on about some of these. Progress isn't linear. It goes up and down in cycles. DSM-1 was published in 1952. How many categories of child mental disorder were there? Two. You either had schizophrenic reaction or an adjustment reaction. Otherwise, you were fine. DSM-4 came out 20 years ago. DSM-5 came out last spring. There's 150 to 200 pages of disorders of childhood and adolescence. DSM-4 actually had a like a section, more than one chapter, on disorders usually first evidence in childhood or adolescence. DSM-5 has reorganized, but many of the disorders in DSM-5 start to appear in the first few years of life or in the teen years. So is it really the case that there were only two mental disorders in childhood in 1952? Of course not, but the recognition has sort of swept like a tidal wave. Now we're paying more attention to it. And of course, the big question now is, are we overdiagnosing? Are we saying that every slight maladjustment in a kid is an indication of a mental disorder? And that'll come up in class two. Developmental psychopathology blends hard science, behavioral science, brain, brain science with qualitative phenomenological accounts, personal experience, with the fields of education, social work, public health. It's really multidisciplinary and it's really growing fast. So as I said a few minutes ago, we're going to start for the next few weeks with a lot of chalk talking principles. I think that it will pay off in the end. So when